All right. Hey, everyone, and welcome to this second session for our CloudOx challenge. That's what we are calling it. We'll probably start calling it as a cohort uh, sessions. Um, it's trying to see if we can rebrand it and so on. I'm just thinking about those ideas as well. And uh, we're going to launch a completely new set of challenge um, from most likely from uh, October onwards as well. So right now we're going through this uh, uh, CloudOps challenge, Cloud CloudOps cohorts, you can call it as that. And we are on the mission number two today, where we're gonna learn about how to deploy the front-end application. But before that, we'll also talk about a few things related to network and VPC. How is uh, everyone doing though? So uh, I see Hemant, um, there's Lenovo, you may want to change your name. Nishant, Pradeep, Ravi, Shahid, Sharad, Shiva. So welcome all of you. And uh, let's get started. I'm going to start sharing my screen and we should be on our way to get started. All right. Uh, are there any questions also? So if, let's make it as an interactive as I mentioned last uh, week as well. So um, good to see you, Pradeep. You're back after a few months. I see that. And, yeah, um, but I'm like, yeah, I had to take uh, some break uh, due to personal reasons. So um, I'm happy to be back. So lo looking forward to one more back, that you're back. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Uh, yeah. So folks, let's make it as interactive as possible. You can feel free to stop me anytime, speak up, ask questions as well. And uh, the idea about this challenge is to build some use case and uh, do some projects, interesting projects like how we do things in real world. So kind of close to the real world like projects. So uh, before we begin, I have um, one bad news and one good news for you uh, in terms of this project itself. So uh, the I'll give you the bad news first. I mentioned about the use case called as uh, UDBC last week. And uh, that has an architecture with microservices stack and I actually started modernizing. This code has been there for a while. Uh, if you have gone through my ultimate DevOps bootcamp, this is the same application that you build. And it has this front end, it has a catalog, cards application, and it's a microservices polyglot application. I actually started modernizing this application and to make it compatible with the latest version of, let's say, Node.js, latest version of Maven, latest version of uh, uh, I think there was a Java application uh, with Maven, there was Node.js, and then there was either a Golang or, um, or Python application. So I was trying to modernize it. I made a lot of <laughs> good amount of progress, but unfortunately I've lost that work somewhere. And I'm just, I was just trying to find out and I um, kind of got disappointed because I'm not able to figure out where that uh, work is. And I think I had not committed it because I didn't want to disturb the ongoing labs, possibly. That's what it looks like. And I may have to redo that entire thing for definitely for Ultimate DevOps Bootcamp. So that's one of the bad news. Uh, the good news though is we have a similar application. It is a microservices polyglot application. Uh, it fits in our stack as well. So there's a front end, there is a catalog. There is no cart service here, but there is a uh, voting application, or there is a recommendation engine. Either, again, a Golang and a Java and a Python and a Node.js application. So kind of similar, not exactly same. I would have preferred an e-commerce app so that you could have you know used it in your interviews and stuff. But nevertheless, we'll stick to uh, at least for this week until I figure out about, if I figure out if we find that work, it's we can continue with that from next week onward. Otherwise, we'll stick to this one. So this is a, again, anyways, this week's goal is to deploy the front-end application, which is a Node.js application. So any which way, it would have been the same, right? So we'll stick to that. Now, last week, we talked about uh, how to create a secure infrastructure with VPC. If you remember that, this is what we talked about. So we've talked about a bunch of things. We talked about how to create VPCs, to create a secure parameter, how to uh, define the subnetting, how it maps to the global infrastructure that AWS has. For example, the concept of regions and um, let's say uh, availability zones. 
let me see. I'm, I'm hoping you're able to see my screen. Yes, no? Yes, Garo, we can see. We can see your screen. Okay, perfect. All right. Okay. In case if you don't see my screen or if you see any disturbance there, just let me know. So we talked about global infrastructure where we have uh, regions. There are like 25 plus regions. Uh, just gonna request all of you to be on mute, please. I'll mute all of you for now. If you have questions, feel free to feel free to unmute and speak. But otherwise, um, appreciate if we all are on mute, um, unless there's a question or a discussion so that we don't disturb others. Okay, so region-wise, we have 25 plus regions and you can host your infrastructure, deploy it across the world within a few minutes to few hours uh, with AWS. That's something you can always do. Now, within the region, there are data centers uh, and those are the log kind of logical partitions of those regions. What are those called? They're typically named as B, C, et cetera. Anyone? You can put it in chat. You can speak up. Either way, it's fine. These are the regions. And a VPC, when you create it, it is specific to a region such as Northern California. That's where I have my VPC created. The partitions availability zone. Availability zone. That's correct. So these are the availability zones, AZs. And then how do we partition? Let's say I create a VPC which is 10, 0. VPC has a cider block. We've talked about cider blocks. When we say 16, uh, how many IPs do I have? This is my network when I say 16 and remaining 16 bits. So there are four quadrants, right? So eight bits in each. That's why the dotted quad notification notation is what we have. And then when we say 16, which is a prefix, that helps us identify the network. This is the list of IPs. And this is what we take and split into multiple subnetworks. And some of these are public, some of these are private. So that our front-end infrastructure remains public the backend infrastructure such as databases always remain private and inaccessible for anyone else apart from the application servers here. So that's what we talked about last week. I showed you how to create a VPC with a visit. This time I'm going to show you how to create it from scratch because what makes a public subnet public and how to differentiate between public and a private subnet. Let's say you have some subnets and I want to find out whether these subnets are public or private. Let's go to the VPC. How would you differentiate between a public and a private subnet based on what? Is it the cider block? Let's say this is the VPC. I created ending 74 and it has subnets. Uh, all right, you can hear that actually. Okay, so based on what? Based on IP address, no. Uh, subnets are partitioned with IP address, sure. So every subnet has its own set of IP addresses. That's how you create the subnetwork, sure. But whether it is public or private, how do you identify that? It's definitely not based on the name because, you know, when you say public and private, and if you can call it as public and private, doesn't mean it is public or private necessarily. It is based on... Uh, Ravi is bang on. So based on the route table uh, with internet gateways. So what makes it public versus private is if you go to the VPC, you can look at the resource map. And what makes a subnet public is the presence of the internet gateway in the route table. And that is missing in private subnet. There's no internet gateway. So how do you differentiate between a public and private is by looking at the route table. If you see this, this is a private subnet for sure. This, on the other hand, is a public subnet because it has the private route and everything else goes via the internet gateway, right? That's what makes it a public or private subnet. Now, these are the minimum things that you must know about when you're designing your own networks. And if you want to create your own VPCs, 
it's from scratch i will show you now that would be let's say you go to create vpc i'm in the northern california region i'm going to say vpc only not vpc and more that would be with a wizard it will create everything for me here it won't and then i'll call it as a vpc called as let's say this is our application uh craftista the name of the application is craftista this is the project name and we want to deploy multiple services like front end catalog voting recommendation uh, related to craftista in one vpc so i'll call it as craftista as the vpc name side a block is let's keep it simple so 10000/16 slash that is my vpc side of block and uh, tenancy is default which is a shared infrastructure basically and i would create a vpc that's it so what do i have now if you look at the resource map i just have the vpc no subnets there is a route table this is called as a main route table every vpc comes with one you can find out from here so my vpc whose name is craftista ends with 85 remember that and subnets are not there route tables you'll see some so if i refresh the route tables i'm going to see one for uh this craftista somewhere here it will be main route table as well and i can identify with uh, the name of my vpc i can filter with the name of my vpc as well if i want the purpose of the main route table is to provide some defaults default configuration so if you don't have any other route table this is the default now i'll create a subnet i'll create two public and two private subnet but i'll create a combination i'll show you the power of cider blocks and cider notations because i'm going to create a symmetric kind of subnet subnet with different sizes so if you look at the previous subnet they were all slash 20 or slash 24 or something like that right so this is my cider block 10000 slash 16 gives me about 65k ips plus some uh, some and i can split that into different sub networks now i'm not going into the side of block i'm hoping that you've gone through the exercises that i've given you last week along with the resource on uh, network design and uh, have understood or done some research on side us side notation at least so this is the side of block the ip starts from 10 this 10 0 remains constant and it starts from 0 0 to 255 255 and how can i split it into different sub networks is let's say if i want to create large subnets with 8000 ips i'll start with one the first subnet will start from 10000 end at 31.255 gives me about 8000 ips so i'm using slash 19 for let's say my public infrastructure here this public infrastructure here i want to create like really large sub networks so let me create four subnets two public two private for this vpc why four subnets is because that's the minimum you need for our infrastructure requirements because we need two public two private spreading across the availability zones i'm just reconnecting two public two private spread across two availability zones b and c that's why four subnets how am i creating four subnets is uh, i'll create two public so pop sub one in two different availability zones that's very important and my side of block this is the vpc side of block and my ip block for the sub network is slash 19 so 0.02 31.255 something like that if that is my first sub network if i choose something like this right so 1.0 it is still part of the same network this has not changed until let's even if i use 20.50 uh, 40 something it is still part of the same subnet the first subnet the same subnet this has not changed this has not changed it would change only if you have something above this 31.255 which would mean 32.0 onwards only then will this and this range change 
because that becomes a new sub network which ranges from 32.0 to 63.255 that is 8192 ips so what that means is if i create a new subnet pub sub 02 it has to be in a different subnet uh, uh, different availability zone that's why we are creating this so essentially i'm creating this and this two public subnets so here i'll have to pick 10.0.32.0 slash 19 because if i use something else right it would not work later on it would give me an error that this is conflicting right now this is fine 32.0 is fine if i want to create two private subnets so these two are large subnets 10.0.0 slash 19 and 10.0.32.0 slash 19. This 32.0 will go on uh, all the way till 63.255. So the next one has to be 10.0.64 something onwards. Okay. It doesn't have to be necessarily 64, but it can be onwards of this. Now, what do I use here? Now, here I want to create subnets which are like holding 8K IPs. Here I want less IPs. Let's say I just want 256 IPs or even less than that. You can do that. You can create as small as slash 28 network. Slash 28 network is going to be just a few handful of IPs, 16 IPs. Yeah, out of that, AWS takes five, like two for network and broadcast, three for AWS, so five are gone. So you'll end up having less 11 IPs also. So you can create as small as that as well. Okay. Uh, I want to create a slightly larger network. Let's say 64 IPs slash 26. Let's say slash 26. So the next network has to be 64.0 onwards slash 26 will mean 64.0 to 64.63, right? Uh, that's 64 IPs, not slash 26 is 64 IPs, and that's the range. So I can create a mix and match. That is the power of CIDR blocks. With CIDR blocks, this is possible. So I can create private subnets, which are small, private subnet 1 in availability zone 1B, with the CIDR block being 10, 0, 64, dot 0, slash 26. What that means is I can take 64.64 uh, four, right? That becomes a new network actually. From 64 to 127, from 127 to again 200 something, and from there to 255 or 256. So like four subnets you can create or more than that, right? So this is my next subnet. So with CIDR blocks, you can design your network however you want. Uh, Tulsi has a question about why the private subnets are smaller than, uh, I'm just showing you an example, that's number one. Secondly, what happens is a lot of times your database subnets are smaller because Let's assume that this is a VPC where you, your entire, your organization has 40,000 develop, uh, like, you know, let's say 1,000 developers. And they're managing maybe 20 different projects. All of this is being hosted with one VPC. Now, within that VPC, uh, you may have a lot of front-end applications, a lot of microservices application, maybe a lot of containers. Uh, and if you use something like EKS, which is a EC2, like Kubernetes service on AWS, each of the pod, each of the container will take an IP from VPC also. So there you need a lot of IPs. So typically those subnets are larger. But when it comes to, you can dedicate certain subnets for DB. So this may be your DB subnet only. When that happens, you're not going to need a lot of IPs. Uh, you may want to keep that smaller. And um, in this case, maybe 64 uh, would be more than sufficient for me for the next year or so. I can, of course, create more subnets later. 
but uh, uh, based on the design, based on your requirements, you can pick and choose the sizes of the network. And another reason I created two different sizes is because I really wanted to show you how cider blocks work and you can create like really compact setup where you can just choose the right size of the network or the segment and uh, uh, you know design it however way you want it. And the next set of uh, subnets can be even larger than even slash 19 and all that. It's up to you. Uh, you have those 65,000 IPs and you can split it however uh, you want it. Uh, in this case, I just created four subnets. Let me show you that for this VPC. And I'll show you the sizes of the subnets also. Five IPs minus is what you will notice. So if I look at my VPC, these two are public subnets. These are quite large. You can see these are like 8,000, 8187 plus five is 8192. That's the number you will get here. If it had been, let's say slash 19, right? 8192 is typically the number. Uh, the first IP is always used by the network. To identify the network, the first IP is used. To identify the broadcast address, if you want to broadcast to all, what address do you use? That is identified here. That is also reserved. This is a reserve. This is a reserve. Two IPs are always reserved in a network. Apart from that, AWS takes three more IPs. So in total, five IPs are gone. Similar to that also, if my slash 16 network or slash 26 network is 64 IPs, out of that, five will be gone. So around 59 IPs are usable for me. That's what that's the number I see here. So my networks are uh, different sizes, right? And each one, each one, each subnet can be of a different size also, right? You can do a very fine grained setup there. And then uh, I'll still have to configure this to be public or private because all these subnets are just created with the default configuration. So it belongs to the main route table. What that means is if I go to the VPC here for craft test, a resource map shows you the right uh, configuration actually it's easy to identify what's going on here so this is the vpc four subnets all are private subnet because it all is mapped to the default or the main route table how do i make these two public is by adding a route with the internet gateway for that i also need an internet gateway i can't just add a route table with a and try to add a public route it doesn't work that way i'll show you creating a route table I'll call it as public route table within this VPC called as graph tester. And within this, uh, this is the route table and I'll try to associate these subnets to it. These two public subnets. Subnets are associated, sure. But if you look at the routes, uh, it has just the local route. Again, this will give you clarity. Just created one more route table called as public route table. There are subnets associated with it. This is private. This is also still private, even though it is called as public. Uh, configuration wise is still private. How do I make it public is by adding a route. If I try to add a route and say, hey, everything else should go via internet gateway. There is no internet gateway yet. Why? Because I have not used a visit. I'll have to create one. So if you don't use a wizard, you'll have to create everything by yourself. And that would mean creating the internet gateway and also associating that gateway with your VPC because this is not attached to any VPC yet. You just need one internet gateway per VPC. So attach it to the VPC, which is right here and uh, done that's it this is the internet gateway now created if i go back to the route table now i see that uh, i can add a route now for the public route table only adding a route with everything else set to the internet gateway now i do see one and now i do have the public route 
this is how I can identify this is a public route table. So this is what you need as a prerequisite if you want to create uh, like a secure, high available, scalable setup with uh, microservices application stack. This is kind of the minimum that you're going to need because when you want to scale your application, scalable also. So if you want to scale your application, you need to deploy it in different availability zones for availability purposes. And uh, then you set up auto scaling for that. If you want your databases to be available as well, high available, you need something called as a multi AZ setup. So multi availability zones, meaning multiple subnets, multiple private subnets, multiple public subnets. Two is a minimum, right? So this is the ideal setup, minimum kind of ideal setup that you need to get started with for sure. That's about VPC. Any questions uh, so far that I've not addressed so far? Any questions that you have? A question by Ravi is, can we resize the subnets later? The answer to that is no, you cannot. Uh, you will have to recreate or create new subnets or just redesign it. So you can't resize the subnets. Uh, Gaurav, I am just having one question. Actually, in my organization currently, um, there are uh, basically two types of applications. Mm -hmm. One is classified as internal and one is classified as external. Sure. So for internal, how, how the design is, uh, everything is in private subnet, including the web layer. Mm. And the include like everything, including the load balancer. Uh, Correct. And for external, still everything is in private subnet, uh, ex except load balancer. Only the load balancer uh, lies in the public subnet. Mm -hmm. So, like, how is this the correct way of designing, or uh, uh, like, what do you think of this? So that can work. So the only thing is the load balancer. When you say, is it on AWS, and is it uh, the application load balancer? Are you talking yes. about? Yes. Okay, so I think you may need to check the public part. The internal, uh, this is fine. So let's say you have a private subnetwork, subnets, and you can have multi multi level subnets also. So you can have public, mm -hmm. you can have uh, multiple private subnets. Maybe this is a DB subnet, this is another middleware, this is your front end public facing application, this is where your ALBs or load balancers could be. Uh, I believe if you have an internet facing load balancer, your applications may not be exposed to the outside world, but they may need to be in the public subnet. That is the one thing that you okay. may want to check. Uh, if you have something like Nginx, for example, a reverse proxy like Nginx, that can be in public subnet and then your applications can reside here. I think no problems at all there, but public facing, uh, you may want to check that part. Apart from that, I think this design is perfect. Um, and uh, you can have, internal facing load balancer also in which case your applications can remain yeah. internal and you may have databases or other backend uh, services within its own subnet as well this is a good design uh, i think that's properly done so uh, okay. you can also have like why would you want to keep this internal is because and who is the customer either your applications in the public subnet maybe application in another vpc is connecting to this VPC or it could also be your office network, your office corporate network connecting to this VPC and accessing these applications. So it doesn't have to be, everything doesn't have to be public. It could be just exposed to your office network. It could be exposed to other VPCs as well. That is the reason where you may want to keep certain applications just private internal only and not expose it outside at all. Got it, got it. And uh, with, with respect to this, like the web layer, app layer, and database layer, right? Um, mm -hmm. Usually the database uh, servers will be present in private subnet. Yes. Um, but, but the web and app layer will usually lie in public, uh, right? But in, in my case, how they are, how it is done is like, um, they are not present in the database subnet, that is private subnet. They call that sub, uh, subnet as public only, hmm. but uh, it is not accessible directly 
from outside world only if i am connected to my corporate network i am able to access that application perfect but if i hit hit it from my outside normal mm-hmm. laptop without connecting to the vpn or without uh, present in my corporate network it is not working absolutely because you can uh, what you can do is you can also keep things in public subnet let's say we're just talking about this subnet which is public like these these subnets which are public what you can do is you can put it behind load balancer load balancer can be public or not have a load balancer also and these ips uh, or these servers if they do not have a public ip they are anyways not accessible from outside mm, okay. yeah so you can create the servers but not have a public ip for it that's one way to control it you can also control it at the level of network with something called as knackles or network acls network acls are the firewall rules at the network or a subnet level right and there you can say who is allowed to access it who is not allowed to access it whether these servers can talk to the internet or not so both ingress and egress rules and allow and deny rule both are available when you set up these knackles and that's why you see security with network acls which is at the network level and this is where you have the default rules right now all traffic is allowed but you can set up allow deny rules here and for ingress and out egress so inbound and outbound both in both direction you can set up allow deny rules for uh, network acls yeah actually none of our servers is having uh, public ip it is only having private IPs. yeah so that explains it it's part of the vpc <laughs> it doesn't have the public ip so it is not available for you to out, uh, access from outside yeah got it thanks karun perfect okay so in terms of security so uh, hemant has a question about uh, this current concept works in gcp as well like most of the cloud providers have it azure definitely has the same concepts gcp i think has a, a slightly different level of configuration Uh, if i have to check that again so uh, gcp you may have to check but azure and aws definitely have uh, uh, same concept same configuration it's just that in azure the name is different it's called as vnets instead of vpcs but uh, there is a way to create vpcs or vnets create subnets make them public make them private there are route tables and uh, those configurations are like parallel okay now uh let's say within this vpc we want to deploy the application server so let's talk about ec2 and also let's talk about a bit of linux there so how are we going to do it the application server the front end web server so this is what we have right now let's say with vpc two public and two private subnets i want to deploy the front end application for craft tester which subnet should i put it in uh that's a question this front end application there's a front end let's say there are back end services and then there is database layers so where should we put the front end in the public subnet how about uh, catalog voting and recommendation these th- three services where should we put them public or private this is where it gets a little tricky databases i think private uh front end web server public that's very clear how about these three should we put in public should we put in private mm, pradeep says private even app servers can be put in private ravi says public i would say uh okay more private great i would say depends right depends on what depends on how your application is because what happens these days is uh, there are two different ways that and this when when i built the application i had to make a very conscious choice here in fact that's when i started with something else i started with the react application actually react js but then i had to switch to express js to fix a particular problem what was that problem i'll tell you here so let's say you have a browser and you in your browser you load these applications right you load the page and you the application loads and this is the application which shows you 
some uh, craft here, some recommend the catalog here, uh, some recommendations. Uh, this is the recommendation here and stuff like that. So this component is fetched from a recommendation service, which is another microservice. This component is fetched from uh, the catalog service. There is a catalog DB behind this. And uh, part of this is where you add votes. So there is one number that you get for every product, uh, maybe a recommendation, maybe a star rating uh, in an e-commerce platform, the actual reviews, let's you can call it as a reviews application. So it's something like that. There is a vote uh, voting application. And then maybe a database behind it as well. This could be a NoSQL database. This could be a SQL database. Now, each of this component is being fetched and loaded from a service like vote and catalog. And then this framework, the front end, that framework, that HTML page is loaded from uh, the actual front end service, which is a Node.js application. Now, what happens is there is a lot of lot of things today can be offloaded to the browser itself and it can be a client side uh, rendering right so if you want to render this uh, from client side this has to connect to each and every service like recommendation voting catalog and if that is a requirement what happens is then your applications each of these services need to be available from outside either through a public subnet or something within that public subnet. That is where I say it depends. Because if your browser is going to connect and establish the connection to each of these services independently, then most likely in most configurations, you're going to keep them in public subnet, everything. But if you have a server side rendering where you are basically rendering via this application and this application is connecting to these services in the backend, then you can cut off this link and you can keep these things in private. Now, this is more like an architectural design kind of a choice. And this is called as a, if I'm correct, it is a server-side rendering on something on that line it is called. I'm not a developing developer and expert, but I'd spoken with a friend of mine who uh, is into the development. He works on the front-end side. And uh, this is how I kind of discovered uh, these, these things. Because when I was building my application, I had that issue where I was not able to connect to each of these services because I was putting it through uh, containers in the backend and it was not possible to connect to all those containers. So I had to switch to express.js with a server-side rendering. And only then this worked because now everything is routed via front-end and front-end is the one which is loading it from catalog voting recommendation and then uh, showing that back to the user. So front-end is the only point of contact for the external users. And if you design it this way with server-side branding, then it is okay to put these in the private subnet, right? So that's the idea. So it depends on the application and how you have designed it and whether you use a server-side branding or everything loads on the client side from every single service. It depends on that. So either you'll have to put something here like front end or maybe a reverse proxy also works. So sometimes you just put a gateway and that gateway fetches or provides you the routing to everything else as well. Like gateways like Kong or some API gateways that you have, uh, you can also do it that way. There are many ways of designing the applications. Okay, now once that is clear, let's say we want to deploy this front end. Front end has to be deployed in public subnet. So that should be clear. And it will be part of, uh, let's say, this particular subnet. So I'll just deploy this using an EC2 server. And this is where we start talking about EC2 as a service. EC2 is like launching VMs on cloud. And these are Linux servers. These could be Windows servers. And uh, when you launch them, you typically launch it within a VPC. By default, even if you don't know about VPC, by default, it gets created within the VPC only. Right. Uh, a fun fact is I have an account from uh, my not this account that I'm going to use for demonstration, but my main account that I use is from 2008, 2009. And when I created that account, there was no VPC at all. You're only EC2 and you could launch servers directly as well. And even VPC came in around that time, but 
it was not mandatory. Like when you launch a server, it was not like it had to be a part of a VPC initially, then they made it part of the VPC by default and design. That's a good thing to have that. Uh, but I still had an account where I could launch the servers without VPC. It was some classic configuration or something it was called. And I still had that option until a few years ago. I've not checked it recently, but it still continued only for the accounts which existed from before uh, a particular year there was this feature available. So that's some, um, some interesting fun fact. So, uh, this is currently everything gets launched in VPC. It's just that in this case, we are being conscious about launching it in a particular subnet, which is a public subnet and provide it with a public IP, right? So that public IP configuration is explicit. And when you launch a EC2 server, you also need to be able to connect to that. So for that, you need to provide something called as a such key pair. And you also need to provide the security configuration. I talked about network ACL, which is at the subnet level. But apart from that, even at the server level, you can configure a firewall. And that is called as anyone knows uh, what is it called? If you configure it at the network level or subnet level, it is called as NACL, network ACL. But if you configure firewall rules at the level of instances, these are called as security groups. Perfect. You also should also know that network ACL will always override the security group. For example, if you have port 80 open from security group, but your network administrator closes it from the network ACL, it will not work even if you have it as part of security group. So sometimes this is a debugging thing. Sometimes what happens is you have the security group configured. It's all good, but you're still not able to access the application. One of the reasons there could be many, one of the reasons could be network ACL. So that's the first thing that you should check if you are not able to uh, kind of access it. I'll show you how to do that troubleshooting a little bit with uh, a tool called as NetStack. So that kind of a debugging is very useful. So uh, what I want to do here is launch an EC2 server with a SSH key pair and a security group configured and I launch it with Ubuntu. And then on top of that, I would deploy a Node.js application. And that application is what I want to launch and start with the system, system D process. So we'll talk about EC2. We'll talk about a bit of a lot of Linux here. And we'll talk about SSH and stuff like that as well, right? So that's what the idea is. So the project for you for this week is to deploy the front-end application within a secure VPC network. So VPC becomes a prerequisite. So create the VPC, use wizard, not use wizard, it's up to you. If you don't use wizard, it's more learning. And once you create the VPC, you have to deploy this front-end application for let's say this crafty stuff service. The application code is right here for front-end and it tells you how to deploy it. So you install node, run NPM install. It starts on port 30, uh, 3000 if you run it via uh, node app.js or just NPM start will also work either ways, uh, straightforward. So for this, I need an operating system. For that, I need a VM and that's where I will create this EC2 instance in a public subnet because it has to be available to the public. So what I do is I switch to EC2 and I'll do prerequisite configuration. First is the SSH key pair. Second is the security group. You can do it later as well, but it's always good to have this ready. So EC2 is where you'll find all the options for key pairs, for security groups, for instances, for order scaling and load balancing and whatnot, right? I'm just gonna keep it simple. I'll fold everything that is not needed right now and just keep uh, the things that we want, instances and networking. So from networking, I'll create key pair and security groups and show you how that would work. A key pair is a SSH key pair. Why is it called a SSH key pair? And uh, what, is the, what is the role of a key pair? So you have a, uh, you know, let's say I'll create a key, key, key pair here called as Craftista in Northern Virginia or Northern California. And uh, 
what happens here is it creates a pair of keys. So one remains on the server side, the other one I got downloaded here, right? So it just got downloaded on my system. The one on the AWS side, what is it called? The one I see on my system here. Uh, what is that called? I have to go to my system locally. Anyone? Come on, a lot of you know these things already. Okay, this is the file. If I look at this, it says it's some RSA private key, PEM, and uh, this is uh, this is private. Uh, what is it called was my question. So this is uh, this is a private key. If this is a private key, this side of the, it's a key pair. We're talking about a key pair, a public key and a private key. That's what makes up a key pair. Um, who has the public key? What is it used for? It is used for SSH authentication. Between what? Between my machine right here where I'm sitting in Bangalore and a server in Northern California that I'm going to create. How do I securely connect to it using an encrypted line is where SSH comes in. Now, why do you need a pair of keys? What is the role of that? This is used for SSH and mainly it's for SSH authentication. And how does that work? Anyone knows Can and can explain? There is a remote server that I have on EC2 and I want to connect to this server. It's for the handshake, it's for the authentication. It's called as challenge response authentication. And it's a very ingenuine, I mean, it's a fantastic way of providing a very secure access to remote servers, right? Because the private key remains with you always. It never leaves your machine, yeah, unless somebody steals it, right? A public key, you can just give it out to anyone. It doesn't matter. If somebody steals your public key, it's fine. It doesn't matter. It doesn't hurt. Why? Because what happens is the way the authentication works is this. So only if you want to connect to a particular server, will that key come into play, right? And what happens then is there is a public key here on the server side. And then there is a private key that you have, and you are trying to establish a connection yourself, right? And when you initiate this connection, right, this is step number one, when you initiate the connection, that's step number one. Now what happens is server knows who you are, uh, which is your public key, right? What is your identity based on that? There is a associated or, uh, you know, there's a couple, right? There's a, uh, there are, there's a pair of keys. So there is a public key matching a private key, right? Now the challenge response authentication uh, works this way. So when you establish this connection, Server sends you a puzzle, a challenge, right? What is that challenge? It just takes some text, garbled text, whatever it is, and it encrypts it using your public key, right? This is an encrypted text. And that encrypted text is the challenge that you have to decrypt. The challenge is to decrypt this. You get that, right? Now, who can decrypt it? Only your private key right? Uh, even if you put like a supercomputer to decrypt it, otherwise without the key, it will take a few years actually to do that, right? So kind of uh, it's that uh, kind of a cost uh, to decrypt it. So only entity who can decrypt it is your private key. And that's what is with you. You're not sharing that at all, right? So without sharing this key, you can authenticate with anyone in the world by, by just sending them your public key and say that, oh, this is the key I may connect with. And when I try to connect, send me it. You can send me a challenge. And when I get that challenge, I will decrypt it for you and send you the answer, right? 
And when that answer is sent, right? So let's say you uh, took this and you kind of decrypted it. Uh, and when that happens, right? That answer is what it is looking for. And when you send that answer here, right? Uh, it authenticates you and says, okay, you're genuine. And now I'll allow you. So you establish kind of a SSH uh, encrypted channel for communication here two way, right? So that is the challenge response authentication. Um, that's the configuration that you will see with SSH also. So that is how SSH works. And it's uh, a great way of providing a secure connection, right? So very useful. It's been there. It's been very, very reliable as well. And it's in open source public domain. So all the bugs get fixed very quickly with SSH also. That's the advantage of having an open source software. Now I created the key pair, my public keys with AWS. I don't care uh, who has the public key unless I'm really trying to talk to them, right? Uh, and then there is a, a private key which remains with me and uh, me alone. And I can also create a, a setup where I don't have to even share or download this key. I can create a key pair and then just take the public key and put it on AWS. And uh, that also works. So you can, you have a way to import the keys too. So there is a way to generate a key pair. There's also a way to import one. So you can also import a key pair and just provide your public key there. And that works, off you go. So this is a secure, uh, for secure connection. And second is security groups is what we use for providing a firewall kind of a set setup where uh, even though it is in a public domain, this public server, not everyone can connect with all the ports, the only expo particular ports which are exposed and you can decide who to expose it to. You can just say, oh, you open it to just one particular IP or one corporate network or uh, you know provide a range of IPs or even a other set of servers from uh, VPC. There are many ways you can configure it. I'm creating a security group for the front-end application. So I'll call it as front-end. in this VPC and then I'll allow only SSH and HTTP. So HTTP for everyone and SSH for secure access only from my IP. So I can say my IP, it picks up my public IP and it will restrict to me only. The only thing about here, this is if your IP changes locally and that's quite dynamic, you'll have to come back and update the rule again. I'm creating a security group. This is what I will use while I launch the server. How I launch the server is this, creating a server. So there are seven steps, seven odd steps that you will have to configure here. One is the name of the server, front end, the image or the template, it's called as AMI, Amazon machine image, which is nothing but a template with either an operating system or with an application installed. You can build your own images as well. I'm just going to pick the latest version of Ubuntu here, which is 24.4 and uh, go to the next one. So an image is important, a prerequisite. So you provide a name. This is the second configuration where I've chosen the image, which is Ubuntu. Number three is the type of server, the configuration. And this is where you can choose, oh, I want these many cores, this much of RAM, this kind of a uh, machine with optimized CPU, optimized memory, optimized GPUs, optimized whatever you want. And based on that, your cost may vary. Uh, for now, if you have a personal account, I will just say stick to free tier eligible, right? Free tier eligible will either be T2 micro or T3 micro. So if you have a free tier account and you are within the first year of usage, uh, this free tier is applicable to you. So I have an account from older. It says free tier eligible, but I still get charged because my account is older. So you just have to be mindful of these things. But if you have created the newer account and if you are within that free tier, this is whatever I demonstrate here will be free, right? So it will come under that free tier only. So stick to free T2 micro uh, to be compliant with free tier. Key pair, I have created one. So I'm just going to choose that. A subnet, this is where we decide where to launch it, whether to launch it here or here or here or here. You can pick any of these subnets. So this is where I choose my VPC. 
and the first public subnet pub sub one so i'm choosing this particular subnet so it will create only in this subnet now this is where the question that we had earlier was this basically i have a server in public subnet but it's not accessible because if you don't allow or if you disable the public ip it is not available at all for you to access from outside it will only have a vpc ip that is the key right so you can expose it via load balancer sure but not directly you can't access it directly which is a good security practice now what we want right now we don't have a load balancer yet so i want to expose it to the outside world so i will create a public ip so i'll say enable this, this is an important step if you want to access it from outside security group i already have one so i've saved some steps here and uh, storage is you can choose different types of storages like magnetic disk ssds high performance ssds so gp3 is a general purpose ssd io is a io optimized ssd these are expensive like high performance ssd these are expensive so you be mindful of that you can also go for a magnetic disk which is a standard like an older generation hard disk that we had in computers so i'll just stick to the default here and uh, nothing in advance right now so i've chosen the name ami instance type key pair vpc and subnet i'm going to count it as uh, one public ip and the security group and those are the seven configurations i provided and i launched the instance this would create an instance which is a vm on demand vm in northern california region that's my vpc so based on the vpc and the subnet it will decide which vpc which subnet and uh, which region and so on right and that's it so i have an instance created and i'm ready to connect to that uh, i should be ready to connect to that within a few minutes and i get a public ip for that i can also check so sometimes what happens is oh you have the instance running you have a public ip but you are not able to connect to it most likely it is either of these issues either a security group issue where there is no inbound rule um, or it is a subnet which is not public so it may say public the subnet but you'll have to check the route table for it and see if it is really public subnet by looking at the route and finding out whether it is internet gateway enabled or not so these are some debugging steps even in this case i will not be able to access it uh let i'll let you figure this out okay so if i go and try and access uh web wouldn't work because i don't have anything set up yet but as such also Uh, it's just going to time out. This is where I can de de do some troubleshooting. So typically I would use Nmap for this. So I want to find out whether I'm able to connect to SSH or not. So I'll use Nmap IP address minus P and 22. If this port is open, I should be able to connect. If it is not, if it says filtered, it has a problem. Now for this, sometimes it uh, blocks so this uses a protocol called as there is a TCP protocol, UDP protocol that is also ICMP protocol. So when you do ping, when your internet is not working, that's what you do, right? Ping google.com. Uh, it uses ICMP protocol that is used to check the routers and stuff like that as well. So sometimes those packets are blocked. So you can mitigate that by using some option like this and Nmap will work. So whenever it says filtered, remember this, this is a problem with security group, firewall, something in between network wise, something in between you and the server. In this case, um, I think you have already figured it out. My issue, Pradeep mentions it. Uh, uh, yeah, Ravi and Pradeep have figured this out, right? So the reason why mine is not working is because my security group, if you look at it, the problem is these rules should have been in the inbound section outbound should be open to all right now right and that is my problem so what i do is i go to the security group and fix it how i'll go to outbound 
and these are not the right rules for outbound. Delete, delete. And I'll have to add the rule where I say all traffic is allowed anywhere. That's the correct outbound rule. Yeah, outbound should be like this. All, all, all is open. Inbound is where I have to add the rule where I say HTTP open to all. But actually, it's, it will not be HTTP. It will be a port 3000 something. Because this application, front-end application, runs on port 3000. So I'll have to be explicit with that. So I'll pick custom TCP 3000 and say anywhere. That's my front end web app. Uh, that is just a description. SSH 22 open to only my IP. When this happens, and I can go back and validate here. my security group configuration now looks fine. And when this happens, I can go and check here again. And I see this open. So network troubleshooting, how do you figure out what's the problem? Uh, sometimes it is not uh, a problem with um, network, it may be something else. Uh, sometimes it is a network problem. So depending on what you want to try and try and do it, uh, this is useful utility and map that is. Now in this case, if I try to access 3000, 22 is open. I should be able to access it. It says open from here. 3000, it says filled, closed. So three different things, right? Filtered is, it may be open, but there is a firewall blocking your packets. So that's filtered, right? So in this case, you focus on security group, network ACL, network rules on your side. Maybe your organization has a firewall or a VP, you know, security group or something on equivalent of that policy. You focus on that. Uh, if it is open, it's all good. If it says closed, this means there's no application running. So it may be able to reach to it, but it's closing the connection because nothing is running on that port. Server is not listening on that port because we have not set up the application yet. We'll look at this again after configuring the application. So how do I connect is by using my key pair, which is what I have downloaded. All right. I'll move my key pair to uh, my typical download path. So SSH key path rather. And even then, I can't just use it this way. Uh, when you try to access the server now, you have to use something like this and then say something like Ubuntu or root, whatever it is, right? So based on the server and the operating system, you will have to pick your username. It could be easy to use, it could be Ubuntu, it could be something else as well. And uh, this is my IP address. So I'll have to use this IP to connect. So here it says unprotected private key file. This is because my permissions on this file are not correct. So how do you set the permissions? Let's have a look. So when you say permissions, I'm hoping that all of you know about these three things. So what does this represent? What does this represent? What does this represent? There are three things. What is number one, number two, number three? Read, write, and execute as the permission, these three, sure. Uh, I'm talking about these three sections. So read, write, execute is multiplied by thrice. Why? This is for the user. This is for the group and everybody else, others, right? That's correct. So user group others, I think you're all clear. I'm just going to change the permissions here and say, make this 
unreadable by anyone else except for the user, not even the group that it belongs to. So 400, or if you are going to retain RW here, uh, it would be 600 permissions updated. So not readable by anyone else. Now, if I try to use a search minus I, uh, it would work. What I would also try to do is typically to save me from running this configuration every time like this, I can also add it to the SSH config. Okay, first I showed you that it's working. This connection is working. I'm able to connect to it using SSH. I've just disconnected this. And what I'll do is I'll add this configuration to my local file called as SSH config. For what? So that I can just connect it, connect to it very quickly using the same key. So whatever key I'm using, I add it as identity file, same username and host name or the IP address is uh, whatever the IP address I have here. Now, what I what happens now is when I say EC2, it just picks up the connection and connects to it automatically. This is like shortcut. So if you want to be more efficient and productive, this is what you should start learning about. This is such config that is very useful thing to know about. Right? So SSH config is a file that you create locally in .ssh directory and config, right? I have this as part of my uh, course on system engineering. So just go through that, learn about SSH config, uh, use maybe chat GPT to learn about it as well. And uh, a very useful configuration that you have uh, here. So there's some documentation on SSH config, this one. Yeah, I, I think this one is good. So just explore this a, a, a bit. You can create these kind of shortcuts. So all of these are shortcuts. So I can connect to this server, this server, this server. I can also jump into it. I think I've shown you this earlier as well. You can also go to a server on private subnet directly by using SSH private, by using something called as a, a proxy command. So I'm connecting to this server, like one of these servers. And through that server, I can jump to a host in the private subnet as well, like here. I can have another server here, which I can't connect to it directly, but I would just say SSH X and it would connect via this to this one. So you can create that kind of a hop called as proxy passing. Uh, so you can do a lot of interesting stuff with SSH. You can create SSH tunnels. You can create a VPN. Over SSH, there are so many things that you can do with SSH. It's, it's very cool. Uh, so I have this server. I'm connected to that. Now it's time for me to, let me connect to that first. Now it's time for me to install Node.js application. So what I'm going to do is become a root here and go to switch to slash opt. This is where I would deploy this front-end application for craft desktop. This is a mono repository. What is a mono repository? All the services are in same repository, like code for front-end, catalog, voting, recommendation is part of one single, single is mono, right? So one repository. So everything is in one repository. So what I do is just go check out this code to this server in op directory. And this is where I have my front end. And this is what I want to build. To build the front end, I need Node.js. And a latest version of Node.js, and then I have to run npm install and whatnot. So if I try running npm, another command to find out whether something is installed or not, you can use which command which NPM, which Node.js. If the application is installed, you will see a path. That is the indication that it is installed. So I use this command. There are various ways of doing it, but I would use this. So whether there's a VI or not, 
I can find it because it's part of the uh, path. And it's not only installed, it's available in the path. Now I need to install NPM. I am going to rely on a guide that I've just created. Still working on it. I will be sharing these, these things with you. Uh, this is kind of straightforward. So I'm installing Node.js, the latest version of it. Uh, that's what I'll do here. This updates the repository cache index, basically list of packages, list of versions available in the repository. The repository configuration is in etc, apt, apt uh, list. Then we install curl because we would want to download some repository for Node.js, right? To set up uh, the latest version of Node.js that is. And once that is there, I could install Node.js using this command, apt get or apt install, both will work the same. apt is just a, like a short name now for apt get. And this should install Node.js. So if I do Node.js now, I see that it's in the path. And I can do Node.js version, npm version. It's the latest version of Node.js, a fairly recent version of Node.js and npm as well. I've just verified it. To deploy the application, I have cloned it already. I'm already in the path where the application code is this config.json and packet.json and whatnot, app.json. So here I can build it using npm install. Now my application is maybe six months old. So there are some updates required here. It might have some deprecation warnings as well. Um, I'm not using VS code by the way, so which editor? I'm not sure. Uh, this is not an editor. This is just a, uh, this is a bear. This is this text editor is called as bear. I use it for, uh, this is basically a markdown editor. I write a lot of markdown documentations and uh, I love it. So I use this bear um, on Mac and it syncs with my devices um, on my iPad and stuff. Uh, interesting application though for documentation and you can organize it. The reason why I use it is you can organize it with notes and hash. Very easy to organize it. Uh, so I'll show you. This is why I use it because I just created this organization by adding a hash. That's why a lot of documentation that I create the labs, you'll see a hash at the end. That's my way to organize it. So if I say challenges cloud ops, it gets automatically organized it under challenges cloud ops and then this one. So if I'm working on a course, um, it generally would be like, let's say Argo course and I have the articles here and I have the lab guides and uh, this is how I typically would start working on it and do the labs and stuff and it just gets organized automatically. Uh, however, I create it and stuff, right? So it's a pretty interesting text editor and I have a ton of content on it already. So each of this is like a one course and uh, stuff, right? So that's a uh, uh, bear. Okay, so NPM is installed. I just have to build it and start it. So I built it with NPM install and NPM start would start the application running on port 3000. Now, this is the time I told you that earlier 3000 was closed. Now I started something. The port is open from firewall. I, I, we already know that. So this time it says open, right? So the question, uh, I mean, if you have a question that, hey, uh, I want to find out whether my application is running or not. How do you find out? Uh, you can, of course, check whether the application is running. You can also check on that server, whether it is listening on a particular port or not using another tool called as 
netstat. And I typically use this netstat with hyphen PAN. PAN, APN, uh, I remember it with uh, the PAN card in India. So netstat hyphen PAN, and uh, then you can grab for a port or an application. So another thing, if you want to tr uh, troubleshoot, like, okay, I have an application running. What is the process ID of that, right? So let's say what is listening on 3000? What is the process ID of that? You can find out using this. That's where this hyphen PAN is actually useful. It tells you the port plus the uh, PIDs actually for the application. It's a node application running on uh, running with PID 2668. So this is a PS with forest and it has started this Node.js application 2668 is where it is running. A lot of times you want to kill a service running or listening to a particular port. So find out the PID, kill it. That's as easy as that. And if you want to find out whether the application is available, can I see it or not from outside, then you do the scanning. That's the network scan that I did here uh, with Nmap. Nmap is from outside, typically, right? To see if uh, do you have visibility there or not. Is someone blocking you or in between? Uh, that's the kind of uh, scanning that you want to do. Uh, a lot of hackers also use these kind of tools like uh, TCP dumps and um, you know Nmaps and stuff like that. And that's also the reason why those pings a lot of times are blocked and stuff like that, right? So. But it can also be used for legitimate purposes, whether my application is listening, whether I'm able to connect to it or not. And for those purposes, this is quite useful. What port, um, I mean, whether that port is being listened to or not, use netstat. And uh, because, you know, you start an application and you don't know which port it, uh, whether the services come up or not, or what is listening on this particular port. There is also, I think, a ls of command. So in Linux, there are multiple ways or approaches to do so one thing. Uh, I use netstat for this purpose, uh, where I want to find out which, um, you know, let's say port, uh, which PID the application is listening on. So it is listening on 3000. I'm able to see it. So I should be able to access it now using the IP address, colon HTTP, plain HTTP, not HTTPS, colon 3000. You see that this is just a front end. We don't have the voting catalog recommendation service. That's why this is useful actually, because when you have that, it will also show up here in green, the status that is right. So I just deployed the front end. That's all I really want to do today. And then there's one more thing that I really want to do is, uh, uh, right now I've started this as a, uh, like an NPM start command. We want this to be started as a service from system at the time of booting the system and so on. And for that, we need some system related script. Earlier, it just used to be run through uh, the different run times and uh, different uh, uh, RC scripts, actually, runtime initialization scripts. Um, but now that the Ubuntu system has moved to the system D, Systemd is a slightly more modern approach, helps you boot faster, has different targets, and at a particular target, a particular commands or particular services are started. And if you want your service to be started, typically after the networking has been established, you want to start your services, you can add a systemd script to have it automatically start as well. Right, I'll show you that. Uh, I'll address a question, any questions so far? Okay, I see one question by Hemant. One thing I want to know about the scripts to join the AD of VM servers, or I mean, we basically want to automate stuff like mount points, uh, monitoring application like Zabbix, CloudStrike, etc. Uh, can you automate with script? Yes, you can. Uh, there are different ways of approaching different things. Like mount points, there is a configuration. So if you want to add the mount points and have them automatically mounted, you add it to etc fs tab. What is mounted, you want to find out, you can check it in etc m tab. This is currently mounted. 
FS tab is automatically mounted. So it can be a network store or storage also like an FS volume or, not, or whatnot that can be automated here. Everything else, a lot of other things, you do it via script. When you launch it via AWS, if you want to do something while the server is starting, you have a configuration called as, anyone knows about that? Probably some of you know. There is a configuration in the advanced details called as user data, exactly. And user data is provided to something called as cloud init. Cloud init gets launched at the time of provisioning. At the time of provisioning of the server, the cloud init gets launched. So whatever you provide here gets added to the cloud or passed on to the cloud in it, and that will run your scripts automatically. The other way to go about it is by adding a agent or some way of managing it centrally with configuration management server like Ansible, Chef, Puppet. You can use any of these tools for automating the system configurations. And then, then you can run whatever you want later also. Yeah, as Ravi mentioned, uh, user data runs once during the provisioning time. That's why we call it as a provisioning time. The first boot is the provisioning time. And uh, if it want to run something all the time, I think Azure has a concept of user data where it does that. And Azure also has a custom data where it does one-time provisioning what cloud in it does. And that's what we call as a user data in AWS. So it's possible to launch things at provisioning time later on you can automate with configuration management okay now the final thing that i want to show you is how i would want to uh, launch it automatically with a system uh, system d script the system d script would go to a particular path right this is where my application is remember that opt craft uh, craft is a front end and if you look at the script here I have to go back to this one. This is my script. Goes as part of HC, systemd, systems, and the name of the service. Craftista frontend, Craftista hyphen frontend is going to be the name of my service. And that's where I create this content of the file. I'll explain the content in a few seconds. So basically, this is a uh, this tells it when to launch it after the network target, right? So when once the network has come up, you start the service. And to launch the service, run Node.js and app.js. App.js is typically the application that you have. And from this directory, uh, restart it right after our uh, keep on restarting in 10 seconds who runs it you can change the user as well by changing also the permissions everywhere else and making sure node.js is available to that you can provide the environment port as well now i think the environment is not set up for this application i'll try removing it visible this for now uh 3000 port is what it's run a run on so I want this to be started at the system boot also. So I'll signal systems D to read this configuration. And then I can start it also. If I look at this service right now, it's disabled, right? Uh, it's not running. It's not running. It's disabled right now. Let me start it with system cuttle, system serial, start. And now I see it's running, right? It just started. This application is running on port 3000. This is my uh, standard out, which it is picking up. So this is a daemon monitor. And I can also enable it at the boot time so that it automatically launches. You can do that as well. It just creates a sim link so that uh, it has that as part of the right configuration. And it's already running. I've shown you that. So it has started automatically. Even if I reboot it, 
it would automatically come up and uh, that is how you add your services like uh, non-demonized like if you have installed nginx it automatically adds this to itself but let me also show you by rebooting this so just rebooting the server this ec2 instance and whenever it comes up my service should automatically come up on port number uh, 3000 that is what i'm expecting so this ec2 instance i can restart it from here as well of course reboot instance i've just done it via linux command and when it comes up uh, i should be able to see this application on port number 3000 yeah it's not uh, running right now it is yet to come up but when it does it should have it automatically uh, launched all right, so Ravi has a question and I just, I think just answered uh, um, that for you. So when you launch Apache, Nginx, all these services that you install, typically it sets up the systemd process. So whatever I just demonstrated here, right from the script, it has those scripts available and it automatically sets up the system uh, D configuration and launches it properly. So it is all done automatically in those scenarios. See, my application has come up. So if I go back to my server, I should see it has just re, uh, reboot. It's been power cycled, so you can see that with uptime, right? I'm just up for a minute uh, and it's been running fine. You can look at uh, what's running, etc. See my node application somewhere. It's not taking a lot of resources, so it's quite resource friendly, it looks like. But if it had been taking more resources, you would also show up here. It would show up here, right? So that's uh, that's that. So that's how you set up your services. That's how you create a systemd uh, process as well. And you add it uh, so that you enable it at the boot time. You can start it, you can manage it via systemctl now. So all of this, Right, I can see that it's running and I can see if there is a problem and uh, whatnot, right? I mean, it has a problem connecting to backend services and that's what it's complaining about, that's fine. But the service is active, it is running, it is enabled and um, everything looks good uh, from this service point of view, right? So um, we just learned what I demonstrated to you today was not only how to create a secure network with VPC and uh, we also talked about uh, how to deploy a web application by launching in EC2. Talked a bit about SSH configuration with SSH, that local config, which is useful. Uh, we didn't dive into group and user management a lot. I was still preparing for it. Like how can you maybe uh, the next step would be to switch the user so that instead of root user, you can launch the service using a non-root user. So you'll have to change the permissions create a user, change the permissions, and then add the configuration in system D uh, that config as well, uh, so that the services are launched as that non-root user. That is something you can take it as a challenge or a exercise as well. Uh, APT is more like a package manager, very straightforward. You, um, I think you, if you just go through the simple commands like APT search, APT uh, install, uh, that's kind of sufficient. If you are using Red Hat based systems, it is yum. If you are using Ubuntu Debian based systems, basically, Ubuntu came from Debian based systems. So base is either Debian or Red Hat. Uh, there are a few others, but uh, those are the more, co more common ones. Now we have smaller systems like uh, Alpine and so on, where you have a different package manager like APK, but it's based on the similar concept, basically. If you use SUSE, it is yum. Uh, not yum, but yast, and uh, there are different commands. So uh, there are different package managers which come with different operating system. But majorly, it is either apt based or yum based, right? So Node.js setup configuration along with systemd is what we looked at. So this is the project I want you to complete as well. What I will share with you would be the recording of this session plus uh, the instructions here, which can help you to 
one is install node.js second is to deploy the application and set up the system d process for it you can take it as a challenge you can try to do it yourself as well or else you can reference this document i will demo i will share both of this uh, with you the video lesson or the recording of this session along with this document you know maybe a pdf format or something right so that you should be able to complete uh, and build the same thing and uh, also try with vpc building the vpc yourself you can use a wizard if nothing else works and then launch the ec2 instance with ubuntu deploy this front end application and uh, next week we'll talk about uh, maybe uh, a couple more services now i'll have to figure out the next one based on the application that we have in hand here right so based on that i'll try to figure out uh, what best we can do uh, for the next week any questions uh, for now uh, Gaurav, actually, uh, with respect to the private instances, mm -hmm. uh, which are present in the private subnet, uh, ideally, they will not be having uh, connect internet connectivity. Correct. So, like, but if I want to download some packages or update, mm -hmm. do some updates or anything, in that case, how will I be able to connect to the internet from the server which is in private subnet? Okay, for this, we have something called as a NAT gateway. So you don't have, you can't connect to it because you don't have an internet gateway that is available in the public subnets. So public subnet internet gateway acts as a two-way router. So it allows you to connect to the internet and get things from outside. It also allows you to get in so that the users can access your application. That's what the purpose of internet gateway is. So what do you do about the instances in the private subnet? Valid question. So what do you do there is uh, you have a few options. Um, the most common option is you set up a NAT gateway. What happens is the NAT gateway gets set up in the public subnet. It's like an EC2 instance running in public subnet. And through that, you can reach out to the internet, mainly for downloading the packages and connecting to the internet for various other services. This is a one-way thing, meaning the external users cannot let's say this is running a web application the external users cannot access this that is how it is supposed to be that is why the nat gateway so it is just allowing you to connect to the internet and uh, that's it and still remaining as a private server so you can use nat gateway if you have a corporate access and if there is a connection set up here you can also use the uh, vpn gateway or vpg there's a VPN gateway, VPN only subnets. Even when you use a NAT gateway, the way it works is it's the route table, which says 0.0.0.0, .0, .0 goes via NAT gateway. And you have that option here. So if you go to the VPCs, you will find all these options for the routes. So if I have a route table, which is private, The routes here, I can add those and I can say 0000, zero, zero, zero. provided I have a NAT gateway, I should be able to add that. That's the NAT gateway. So you have internet gateway, you have NAT gateway, you have v VPG, virtual private gateway for corporate connection. You can have another VPC. We can have uh, a few other things here that you can use in the route tables. All right. And uh, the, the key pair that we are downloading uh, from the portal, right? The PEM file. Mm -hmm. That is actually the private key. That's the uh, private key. Yeah, and the, the public key will be there with AWS. Correct, correct. That is right. Oh, okay. In current setup, that is how it is. But what you can also do is generate the key pair locally. If you generate the key pair on your system, your private key never leaves your system. It generates a private plus public and you take the public key and put it in AWS. That is a better way of keeping this even okay. more secure. And that is also a good way to be able to connect to different regions because this key pair is only limited to one region. If I want to connect to a server in another region, I'll have to create another key pair. If I have my own key pair though, 
I can take my public key, yeah. put it in different regions and use the same private key to connect to servers anywhere else. So that's another advantage of doing that. So we have to import the public key, uh, right? That's uh, right. Yeah. You just have to import the public key rather than creating one. Yeah. And for this Node.js application, like if there is something that is going wrong, mm -hmm. uh, there will be some particular log file which we can look into, like what has happened. So what happens with Node.js is right now it is going on, uh, going to that system CTL. So whatever is going wrong is being logged here itself. Uh, depending on the application, it this can vary. So everything is going into standard out, standard error is going here only. Um, if you have, otherwise, if you're just launching it as, let's say, opt front end, and let's say if you're doing it from here directly, like NPM start, you will find the logs right here, actually. So it depends on how you have configured it. Yeah. If you have a different log file, then it will go there. If not, it might be just part of system CTL as well. And you may have to check with system CTL status or something. And uh, it depends on how you have configured it, really, the logs. Got it, got it. Thanks, Carl. Yeah. Yeah, hi, this is Hemant. Hi, Hemant. Yeah. So I want to one thing more, uh, like uh, in the, how the routing happen in the for particular VM? Because we are not able to, I see in the GCP particular, mm -hmm. we are not able to particular log in VM and not able to ping the gateway actually. So I think something layer two routing is not supported in virtualization like in cloud uh, providers. So what like are that. you trying to do? So where are you trying to connect from a, a v, like a VM in GCP? Which gateway are you trying yes. to connect to? Uh, it's local gateway only. So like uh, if providing is a local, no, it's one of the IP addresses and mm -hmm. the gateway. But uh, mm -hmm. when residing in the logging machine, and you're not able to ping the his gateway actually. So sometimes what also happens is the pings are blocked with ICMP. So it really depends on what you're trying to do. If you have a setup, we can have a look at it. Again, I'm not a GCP expert. Uh, so I'll have to mm -hmm. look into this as well. But in what... AWS is able to ping the gateway. Can we? Which gateway? gateway? Are you talking about internet gateway? Local. No, 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 no. Uh, in we local, what does that subnet mean? Local, local network. Subnet, no. We creating is a gateway. Any package so you are talking uh, about uh, the dot one address. Yes, yes, yes. Like uh, something IP. So for example, I have twenty six dot fifteen. So you are talking mm -hmm. about uh, whether I can connect. So that ping may not be may not work actually. And that's fine actually. So if just push route hyphen n, we can see we can see the gateway in particular in VM. No, I think route hyphen n is not working. Yeah. Route so these gateway, fine. yeah, yeah, yeah. Talking yeah. about this, right? This is this is fine. Even if you're not able to ping it, that's fine. Yeah, yeah. See, not able. To... It it is working In here, case, but even if it yeah. doesn't work, that's fine. I'm saying so. Okay, okay, okay. Sometimes also pings are blocked. TCP, I mean, uh -huh. the ICP protocol is blocked. Uh, but uh -huh. you may be able to still route through it and all that. So it is, uh, I think it is fine. Uh, even if you're not able to kind of, uh, ping the, uh, dot one or the gateway IP. Oh, okay. Fine. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Sure. The Gaurav, uh, this is for the quick question. I didn't attend the last session, but, uh, is it available? Uh, this cloud mission, uh, the cloud ops mission challenge is available on my dashboard. I don't see it when I log uh, it's in. not there yet. I'll add it there. It's there on the YouTube right now, but I'll add it to our dashboard as well. So there were a couple of questions related to that. I'll create a challenge. Now that we have a couple of sessions here, I'll create okay. it and upload it to our portal as well. So how are you going to share this, uh, talk, uh, we are going to send it through email. that through through our portal through our portal. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. So once I add it uh, along with the video, I'll add uh, that as well. So when can I expect sometime this week? Or like you're going to add like uh, yeah, yeah. It? Tomorrow I'll definitely do it because this is like I'm uploading uh, immediately. Uh, it's mm -hmm. there on YouTube in few hours, and then uh, I just have to put it on the portal, uh, link it to the portal. That wouldn't take me too long. So uh, this week I have some time, so I'll do it tomorrow. Yeah. Okay. No problem. Thank you. Yeah. I think Ravi has also shared the link for the mission one from there. Yeah. You'll end up. Uh, anyway. Yeah. I got that link in your email itself. So, you know, yeah. perfect. Thank you. Cool.
All right. Any other question, folks? All right, then. So that's all for this week and this session. And uh, next week, um, again, this is kind of dynamic. So uh, we'll come up with the next challenge and uh, I'll put it there. I'm still designing uh, all of this really. And I'm still hoping to get my work back so that uh, we may be able to explore uh, the other application too, right? So um, with that hope, uh, we'll conclude the session for this week. So thank you, uh, the live session for this week. So thank you very much. And we're coming back on Thursday just for a coaching call if you have any questions, anything. Uh, but otherwise, for the challenge-wise, we will come back next Monday, same time, 9 o'clock, and uh, continue. Thank you, and I'll see you uh, on Thursday and on next Monday. Bye-bye. Yeah, thank you, Goro. Good night. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, Goro. Thanks, Goro.